Welcome everybody, I'm Marie Harvey, <clears throat> the Associate Dean for Research here in the College of Public Health and Human Sciences, and um, I'm delighted that you're joining the seminar today. This seminar is being co-sponsored with the Health uh, Management and Policy Academic Program in our college. And to uh, introduce and to moderate the session today, uh, we have uh, Allison Myers, who's affiliated with our academic program, but she's also the director of the OSU uh, Center for Health Innovation. And she's uh, graciously agreed to moderate and to introduce our speaker today. So I'm gonna pass it over to you, Allison. Thank you. Wonderful, thanks so much, Dr. Harvey. I'm Allison Myers, I use she, her pronouns. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to the Friday Research Sem Seminar. We're so glad you're able to join us. We're using a webinar format today, which means that all of your microphones are muted. Uh, to ask a question on Zoom, which we encourage, Dr. Knapp will leave uh, time for Q&A at the end of the hour. Please use the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. Uh, I'll be moderating it and I'll read the questions out loud uh, so that we can uh, respond to them all. I uh, am thrilled to have Dr. Capri Snap uh, with us today uh, uh, to give a talk on North Dakota Medicaid's 1915I approach to addressing social determinants of health for clients with behavioral health diagnoses. Uh, Dr. Knapp is the Director of Medical Services at the State of North Dakota Department of Health, uh, AKA the Medicaid Director is the shorthand that I use. I hope that uh, fits, pretty sure it does. I see, I see Dr. Knapp nodding. Um, this is a position that Caprice has had since 2019, uh, but she has 20 years or so of experience working on Medicaid and children's health insurance programming in the private sector, in state and federal policymaking and in academics. So for those of you who are interested in those kinds of, of programs and services, Dr. Knapp is the speaker for you. Uh, before she was in North Dakota, she was the federal policy director for Molina Healthcare, a Fortune 500 multi-state managed care organization specializing in Medicaid and Medicare programs. Uh, she's also served in the governor's office of state planning and budgeting in Colorado. Uh, and where I met her uh, was in 2017 uh, when Dr. Knapp was a health policy fellow uh, with the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, serving the Energy and Commerce Committee in the United States House of Representatives. Um, I think it's really important that folks understand that you focused your entire career on vulnerable populations and delivery system reform and global health. You've, got, uh, you've authored more than 80 peer reviewed publications, 60 government reports and two books. And uh, you're also a really good friend and mentor uh, to colleagues like me and to the students that we'll get uh, to meet with you, to spend an hour with you a little later today. So without further ado, uh, I'll turn it over to you, Dr. Knapp. Thanks so much for being here. Okay. And, and whoops. And about 40 minutes, 35 minutes. Yes, and uh, and thank you so much for those kind words, Allison. And, and and I know you're gonna um, flag me when we get close to that 40 minute um, mark. Um, also say, listening to you, boy, I feel um, one, very grateful for um, the places that my career has taken me, but also that's pretty exhausting just to listen to that list. Um, so I'm gonna go through our approach to social determinants of health today. Hopefully you can see the slides and they're advancing well. Marie, can you shake your head if, if, if it's there? Okay, there we go. Um, and so I'm gonna assume that you all are gonna be interested in the front part of this and the end part of this. Uh, the middle part of it, mm, we can skip things. I'll leave it for your reference. The middle part of it is a lot of logistics and operations, um, but the front part and the end part, I'm gonna to try to focus on the most. And so um, you all know in your coursework, in your professions as faculty, social determinants of health. So I'm not gonna spend a lot of time here other than to say, um, you know, thinking up from a program perspective and from a payer perspective and from a government programs perspective, I don't think that we need to be convinced on our side, and I say that as a Medicaid director, that social insurance of health are important. Um, and, you know, sometimes folks will come to me and they'll show me a lot of evidence. This, this journal article, these 
papers and grants, I totally um, am on board with that. I, I think where um, it's taken more work is thinking about, um, again, the recognition that individuals have these needs beyond the healthcare system. Um, and so the pressure becomes of how do we identify the interventions that are most effective? Um, how do we scale those? And then how do we find sustainable and funding sources? So the second part of that is really where I've come in. Um, so again, um, don't need to be convinced that this is important and this is the best way to go. Um, but before, um, in the last maybe 15, 20 years, the approach has been different. Um, of course, on housing, you know, HUD and other local and state housing authorities have, have heralded that work and done a fantastic job. And then on um, food deserts and food insecurities, you've seen the work that SNAP has done and food banks and local organizations and on employment supports and education supports, et cetera. And so it was interesting to me um, how those other agencies have been working. And then now all of a sudden um, in the last, I don't know, five to eight years, this has now become a Medicaid issue. Um, and so one of the first questions that I asked is, um, and it took me a while to come around to this, I'll, I'll admit to you all. So um, what's the role that Medicaid plays? And I'll tell you that part of my initial um, hesitation is I already run an entire health insurance program and I run um, and I run healthcare programs that are outside of that. And so my question is, I'm not a housing expert. I'm not an employment expert. I'm not an education expert. And so part of that is really, I struggled with, well, what is Medicaid's role? Um, one of the things that is clear is that Medicaid is a very stable funding source. And so I totally understand that. Um, and so one of the questions I had, well, if we have HUD and I have SNAP, we have all these other services, what's then my role in terms of thinking about what I can fund and what I can um, pay for? Um, and what are the benefits of the cost in doing this? And so over the last, again, between five and eight years, we've seen states figure out how to do this. Um, and I'll go through a couple of the different ways that they states have figured out how to do this. Um, and I have 100% come around on this. So again, it's not that I ever didn't understand social determinants of health and what was important, but it really was about um, thinking about what is my role in this? I don't want to duplicate what's happening at these other agencies. I have a ton of respect for them. I have to stretch my money as well. Um, in North Dakota, the Medicaid program is the biggest line item in the entire budget. And that's the case probably in, in your state and other states as well. So again, it's, it's great that it's a stable funding source, but we get a ton of pressure about how much money we spend. And I don't have staff, again, that know these areas. And so as we've started to see other states come out with these, it's become um, more clear how we can move forward and it's become clear what the limits are. And so I'm gonna go through some of these and hope get you to start thinking about if you're interested in this from a research perspective, um, you know, how would you go about looking at what's happening in Medicaid? Even if you're not interested in Medicaid's role in social determinants of health from a research perspective, if you have your paper on social determinants of health and you get to the end and the discussion section, it's really critical, or in your grant, it's really critical to think about the stage. What's the background that's happening? And so to be able to think about those policy levers that can be pulled um, is really important. Um, so I'll go through uh, these different authorities at the end in the rules. And they've been, it's been interesting to see these um, rolled out by the federal government. And so, and this would cut across at least two or three different um, administrations. So we've seen at the federal level, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services roll these out in different ways. Um, but these are the three main tools that we have as the Medicaid department to help enable and push forward social determinants of health. Okay, so the first one. Um, so essentially in states, as you all know, you either have care that's delivered in a fee-for-service basis or in a managed care basis. Um, and so what that means is in states where they are managed care states, 
most of the delivery of health care is um, contracted out to big managed care plans. And Allison mentioned that I used to work at one, which was Molina. Um, and so one of the things that we have as a lever to pull is when we write those contracts with those companies, we can say to them, you can provide in lieu of services. And what that means is I will continue to pay the same amount I planned on paying you per month per member, but you can offer services that are uncovered on your own. And so you might think to yourself, well, that's odd. Why would a company ever offer services for free? Um, part of it is a competitive answer. Um, you can imagine that these contracts are pretty lucrative. And so when you have companies competing, um, they'll write in their proposals, yep, we'll offer some of these free services. Um, and so in, on the social determinant self-health side, that's where we've seen a lot of these um, services move forward. So they'll say, we'll provide in lieu of services around food insecurity, or we'll do a fresh fruit pharmacy. Um, again, I'm not particularly paying for those, but they're doing it under the amount that they're getting paid. Um, the second thing that we do, and this is the topic for today, um, waivers. Uh, a waiver is exactly what it says, which is in Medicaid, I'm required to offer the same services to all the members regardless of where you live or anything else about your population. A waiver allows me to carve out a separate set of services and a separate set of benefits to targeted groups. So for example, you're gonna hear me talk today about our approach on the 1915I, which was for members that have severe mental health issues and traumatic brain injury, we're gonna offer these social determinants of health services. Um, and then the last point that I will say is Medicaid never pays for room and board. And so I've been asked a lot about, well, you know, we have folks that are in a inpatient psychiatric facility. We have folks that are in a nursing home. We have folks that are um, in the corrections department. And so aren't these services important for them as well? Um, and the federal government has, is very particular about what can be offered when you're in an institutional setting. Um, and this is not one of them. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about our experience. Um, so we are a very conservative state. Um, we are, gosh, over 90% Republican in the legislature and our governor is a Republican as well. Um, but interestingly enough, when I came here in 2019, there was a long-term behavioral health agenda that both the executive and legislative branches had endorsed. And so this 1915I um, authority was part of that plan. And again, the idea is to increase access, increase services, and it really was around this targeted group. Um, and so again, the legislature said that we wanna focus on clients with behavioral health, severe behavioral health and traumatic brain injury. And so they gave us $8 million to do this. Um, now in other states, they, they probably would laugh at that $8 million. Um, we are a very small state, I only have about 120,000 people on Medicaid, um, but $8 million is quite a bit for us. And then the other thing I'll just mention for you is um, so that if you're thinking about research and research ideas, um, so COVID also put, a, um, put an emphasis on this work. As you all know, um, there was a lot of focus on institutional care, a lot of concern about what was happening in nursing homes and congregate settings. And so during the Trump administration and also now in the Biden administration, there is a concerted effort to spend more money on home and community-based services. Um, and just yesterday, we saw that the Biden administration is coming out with even more regulatory guidelines for nursing homes. Um, and so we got quite a bit of money um, in the um, American Rescue Plan Act to help shore up our home and community-based services. Why am I mentioning that? Because again, these social determinants of health are usually provided in home and community-based settings. They are not allowed to be provided for in an institutional setting. So this is yet another opportunity for states to use these new dollars to invest in the workforce and the services around this. And each state has their plan online. Um, and if you're interested and you need help finding your state, I'm happy to point you in that direction. So we've, we've got some momentum here. Um, we've got legislative push. We've got a governor's office that agrees. We've got um, money, extra money from the federal government. 
Um, again, all those things you should be thinking about from a research perspective, where there's a ton of dollars that have come through um, on the COVID, um, the two swaths of COVID dollars that we have. So this is a great opportunity to look pre-post and see how social determinants have been advanced um, and in what kind of setting and what state's different plans are. So I'll go through a little bit about um, our plan. This is the part that I think if we skip through and we end up not focusing on a lot of the slides, you will have them, happy to provide them. Um, these are the nuts and the bolts of how we did what we did. Um, so again, we've got, um, everything has to be done in the home and community-based setting. That's a requirement of the federal government. Um, and who can be served in our program? So we have children and adults. They have to first be eligible for Medicaid. And then second, they have to be eligible for this 1915I program. And so the question is, what are the benchmarks that get them eligible? So again, as I explained, they have to have a qualifying diagnosis um, by their provider. That's a letter that has to be written that, you know, you have substance use disorder, you have a mental health um, condition. And then again, I keep saying the word severe. And so in order to qualify for the program, um, you have to meet a functional impairment um, benchmark. So we use the HUDAS, the H-O, W-H-O-D-A-S, um, don't ask me what that means, other than it's um, it's by the World Health Organization, and it's a pretty it's very valid and it's a pretty commonly used functional scale. Um, so we say that you have to have the letter from your physician, you have to have a score of 25 or higher on this functional impairment scale, and you have to be eligible for Medicaid. Um, I'm going to skip over this one um, only to and move to the map only to show you that. In um, North Dakota, we have a little bit of a different setup than some states um, in that when you go to apply for Medicaid, everything is done at the county level. And so you can see a map, we have over 50 counties. Um, and so the first stop is you go to your county, you apply for Medicaid, and then at that same county zone, um, you're applying for 1915I. We don't process applications at the state level, and so another thing from a research perspective you should be thinking about when you see these types of slides is that's a lot of variability in terms of how these rules are interpreted, who shows up for these. Um, but nonetheless, this is how we, this is how we process enrollment. Um, so again, they come to their zone worker, they have the diagnosis, they have the letter. Um, Question on who can administer the HUDAS. So this is a really, really tricky one. Um, as you all know, through, through research and through research um, studies that you've read, sometimes picking, picking a functional assessment tool is not easy. Um, and what's even more difficult is pitching, uh, picking the cutoff. Um, so HUDAS, again, is a tool. Um, it cannot be done by self. That was a rule that CMS said no. Uh, we tried to say, well, someone should be able to fill it out on their own. Someone should be able to go out online. And CMS said no. Um, they said it has to be filled out by someone that has been trained. Um, and so once you know, I'm sitting in front of you, um, we're filling it out together. I'm helping you if you need help interpreting the questions. We fill out the assessment tool, and then it's scored. And again, the provider or the person sitting in front of you has to have training on how it's scored. Um, let me go back to this one for just a minute. So what are some of the issues we came up with? Again, it couldn't be self-administered, even though the HUDOS has been validated that way, CMS would not let us. Um, and then we had to pick that benchmark of 25. Um, and I have some slides later to tell you about um, how that became pretty political pretty quickly. Um, as of today, um, and that this number is actually a little bit low. We have 10 more. So we have 47 folks enrolled. Um, and I'll talk about the services in just a minute. So you I'm sure that part of the reason we would look at this number and say, actually, I think it's about 58 now is, oh, that's low. Um, totally agree with you. One of the things um, that I've seen in the last 20 years in working in Medicaid is you don't stand up a program on January 1st and then on January 10th, you have a ton of people. These things take a lot of time to communicate, to message, to set up the infrastructure so that people know where to go. They know how to fill this out. 
And we really struggled with whether we should even start this um, when we did, because COVID was happening. And so we were getting a ton of pressure from everyone saying, can you please delay it for a year? Can you please delay it for three years? This is, this is so difficult for us. And as the county, now we're gonna have to figure out how to um, sign people up. We went ahead um, and knew that we were gonna have a very slow rollout, but it was critical to us because what we were seeing on the COVID side was also some people were losing their housing. Some people were losing their jobs. And we just felt that it was really critical that if we didn't move forward, um, you know, this could be an issue for some of our clients. So again, thinking at it from a research lens, you know, you want to be very careful as states start to roll out of these things. Are you looking at the first six months? Are you looking at the first year? Um, in doing a major rollout of services, um, it's my prediction that it could be up to year three before we get to a saturation point. So what are the services that we provide? Um, so there are, I think, three other states that have a 1915I um, waiver like we do. We provide more services than any of those states. Um, and you can read through these. I'm not, gonna, I'm not gonna go through them except to point out to you on the top left-hand corner is care coordination. Everyone is required to have a care coordinator in order to get any of these services. So client comes in, they enroll for Medicaid, they enrolled in 1915I. The first thing we do is, is pair them with a care coordinator. And then they sit down, they go through the um, session with their care coordinator, they come up with a plan, um, and they do that motivational interviewing. Um, and then the care coordinator ticks the boxes and says, okay, well, um, you know, Jimmy uh, needs housing supports and peer support, but doesn't necessarily need some of the other ones. Then there's an action plan. And so then with our, our system, I know that that's what Jimmy is, um, is authorized to have. So again, very proud of the fact that we have a large array of services. Um, and I won't go through this one, but this is a more, um, dis, um, more narrative about what these mean. Specifically, for example, I didn't know what community transition services was. Um, I didn't know this is what CMS called it. But if you are in that institution, you are in a jail, you are in a mental um, hospital, a state mental health hospital. Again, we can't pay for the services while you reside there. But when you transition back to the community, um, we do have some services we can provide in that transition. Um, some of the most important ones that I would point out here is on the housing. Um, Medicaid will never, ever, ever pay for housing on a long-term basis. So CMS has allowed us to do things like, um, first month's rent or help turn on um, utilities. But um, as of now, the federal government does not allow us to pay housing. Um, and so again, as you walk through this list, you have to be thinking, I have to be careful that I'm not duplicating what the housing services, what SNAP is doing. I have to live within the Medicaid guidelines um, but these, this is very exciting. These are services that we, um, a lot of these services, we don't offer to any of our other clients. Um, second piece of this is, so we've talked a little bit about the client part. Now I'll talk a little bit about the providers. So we have to recruit providers. Um, and again, these numbers are a little bit old, but you can see we have 80 individual providers and 25 group providers. Um, and boy, this is, um, this, this is pretty difficult. So think about it this way. You are a housing provider. You help people um, find permanent housing or you help them when they um, have housing instability. And up to this point, how we've been paying you is through grants. You've got, you're a nonprofit, you've got a fantastic staff of grant writers, um, or maybe the county has given you some money um, maybe the state has given you some money, but it's typically grants or it's all state dollars. And so what we had to do is broker this um, relationship with those partners to say, okay, we're going to come in and we're going to move you off of all those 100% state funded dollars or the grants. And it should help you become more stable, right? Because Medicaid is stable funding. Now you can start billing us, right? 
So instead of it being 100 state dollars, um, you can now get, it'll be a 50-50 match. And in theory, that sounds great. Um, and it's really what we strive to do for the state overall. We say, look, we want to subsidize Medicaid dollars for dollars that are already being spent. However, um, one of the things that we've really had to like take a time out and be sensitive to is if you are a housing provider and you're not a medical provider, boy, Medicaid billing looks real scary. And I, I now have such an appreciation for that. Um, if you're used to working on a grants-based system, you know, you fill out your, your um, at the end of your grant, you turn in your outcomes, you apply for another grant, but your money comes. Your money comes every month or your money comes when you turn in your deliverables. That is completely different than having to submit bills for every service that you provide. So there's a lot of work done on the provider side um, in terms of um, making sure we can support those brand new providers having them even apply to be Medicaid providers, helping them figure out what billing means. And to be honest, we've spent more on that piece than on anything else. Um, and we'll continue to. So it's a big, big commitment. Um, I'm gonna skip this one, it's not as interesting. Um, we do have Medicaid expansion in this state. So thankful for that. Uh, we do provide these 1915i services both through our traditional or, and our um, expansion. Um, the trick to that one is we actually have a managed care company that does our expansion. So everything that I'm doing here on the fee-for-service side with my traditional Medicaid program, I then have to write into a contract um, with my managed care company. Um, we've now have uh, two different managed care contracts that we've negotiated this with. And again, on the one hand, it's helpful because we're not doing in lieu of services anymore. We're not asking you to offer these things for free. Um, however, um, what's difficult is I now have to put in a contract and I have to put a price on it. Um, and so let me see if I have a... Um, so I'll talk a little bit about pricing and then I'll give you another story about our HUDOS measure. So again, I have to put this into a contract and I have to say to the managed care company, um, we want you now to provide these services. Um, and so you should think, you should be thinking, oh, well, managed care companies know how to do this, right? Like I read an article how Kaiser bought a whole apartment complex for their members, or they, you know, Geisinger does a fresh fruit pharmacy. Um, and I can totally appreciate that. But those are big national health plans that have a lot of, um, you know, have the depth of resources to be able to do that. Um, our plans are small regional plans. So we have Sanford Health Plan, um, and then we have Blue Cross of North Dakota. And so one of the things that we have to, and certainly they're in the community, they're helping out, they're doing community projects, but, um, you know, th this isn't United Healthcare. Um, and so we have to work with our partners and think about how can we work together to push social determinants of health. So I'll give you some examples. Um, so for example, peer support specialists, um, that's one of the most important things that we're providing here. Um, you know, this is um, really comes into play when we have clients that have addiction issues. And so we want a peer support specialist to be able to sit down with them um, and to help them through their journey. Um, however, a managed care plan says as part of their contract with us, um, they're not allowed to hire anyone that has a felony record. So we have to work through that. We have to figure out how can we still offer that um, service and how can we work with them as an entity and as a private company to do so. Um, the other piece to this is I'm an economist. And so one of the first things that I'm always gonna ask is, well, how much does this cost? Um, again, I told you we got 8 million from our legislature to do this. Um, however, um, all these services that I showed you, and I'm going to go back to that slide, so don't get dizzy for a minute. I'm just going to pull over these slides. Okay, so every one of these slot, every one of these services, we had to price out. Um, and so I'm an economist. I thought, oh, okay, well, you know, we'll we'll work with our actuary. We'll figure out how to do this. Um, nobody really knows how to do this. Um, so for, I'll give you some examples of ones that were easy and ones that we were just like, I don't even know where to start. 
So um, non-medical transportation, that's something that we um, already offer in our state to our Medicaid clients. We offer um, emergency transportation. Now we're going to offer non-medical transportation. So that says, I'm not going to take you in my taxi to a doctor's visit, but I'm going to take you in, in my taxi to your um, to, to meet with your housing specialist. So I already know, though, how much it costs to go on a taxi ride in this state. So that one, OK, a little bit easy. Um, let's see, supported employment. Don't know how to price that. What does that mean? Um, housing supports. Again, are we pre-tenancy? Are we middle of tenancy where maybe we're worried about somebody might be evicted? Or are we somebody's been evicted and now we really got to push in on housing supports? Um, where I offer housing supports also depends on how much you get paid. So for example, if you're, if you're in my office and I'm the housing support specialist or you're on the phone with me, Okay, that's, that's one way to look at it. But what if I have to go in the car with you to go meet with your landlord and help figure out how to fill out the paperwork? Then you as a provider might say, well, I need more money for that because there's a transportation piece. Um, and so pricing these out, extremely difficult to do. Um, this is where I think also the research needs to be aware. Um, and you need to, when you're, when you're thinking about these things, this, these are really critical caveats. So for example, when we reached out to our federal partners at CMS, um, there was little, they said, oh, well, you just price it out like a health insurance company would. And I said, well, wait a minute, you know, other than the big health insurance companies, people are doing this um, in lieu of, it's all being done for free. So I don't know how much this costs. Um, so at the end of the day, we worked with our actuary um, we did the best job that we could. Um, and if you look at the total amount we pay on a capitated basis to our managed care company, you know, this doesn't push up that by a ton. Um, but at the very least, we still have to add dollars to it. So this is one hit and a miss. I, I mean, I'm going to be so bold as to say, I'm not really sure that we're accurately pricing these things. Um, but I am confident to say that if we're doing it wrong, the providers will let me know as soon as possible. Um, so again, as you go through and you look at research um, and you're, if you wanna look at costs, just be aware of, I, I don't know that any of us have the best information. Um, and then finally, um, I'll tell you the story about the 25 and then I'll go through this on research opportunities. Actually, Allison is texting me now, so I'm gonna go ahead and go through research opportunities. Um, okay, so the first piece of research is what is Medicaid's role in social determinants of health? And if that's something you're interested in, you want to learn more about, you want to go down that road, please look at what kind of authority is being used in that state. Because a 1959 state plan amendment for me looks totally different than if you're in Florida or Texas, where 100% of their Medicaid programs are being delivered by managed care. And so you'd really have to dig into those managed care contracts to figure out what that means. Um, an 1115 waiver is another option um, that states have. But the good news is when you count it all up, um, I think the last time I checked, it was almost 30 states that were doing something in the realm of social determinants of health in their Medicaid program. Um, so again, um, if, that's what, if that's what you want to look at, if that's what you're interested in, be really mindful that the, the policy lever that we pull looks really different in different states. Um, second, uptake of services and impact of services. Um, and so, um, again, be mindful that there's a timeliness to this. If you want to look at a program in year one versus year three versus year five, it's going to look very different. Um, you know, uptake of services sometimes, um, you know, our stakeholders are telling me these are really important, we need these services, and that's great. Um, however, it still is a messaging and a communication with the clients because they have to take that first step of going down to the county and asking and bringing the letters. Um, so uptake of services isn't enough to just roll out the program. Um, and so that's part of what we're working on now. Impact of services. Um, again, do we have an evaluation for this? Um, it goes with the next data point about a need for integrated data systems. So Connecticut has done the best job in this space. 
Um, and so my question would be, or something for you to think about, let's suppose that I look at a pre-post analysis. Let's suppose that I look at how much uptake I've had of my housing service or my employment service. And I wanna look at a pre-post analysis of maybe how that's impacted ER use, or maybe how that's impacted inpatient utilization. Um, the issue though is, um, what is the housing authority doing? What is SNAP doing? Um, if we really want a picture of those clients and their entire social determinants of health experience with us as a state, I need those other pieces to come in. Um, and so Connecticut, <coughs> excuse me, has done quite a lot of work in that area. Most states though, really, really, we just don't have the systems yet. Um, the other thing is, again, because I cannot pay for your housing, I can only pay for first months and then some counseling services or some housing navigator services. I really want the housing authority to be involved for that middle part. So, for example, <clears throat> let's suppose someone comes back to us and says we can't successfully house this person because, you know, they can't pay their rent. I need to be able to then coordinate with the housing office. Um, and if we had integrated data systems, that would be fantastic. So I think we're all working from a very um, rudimentary um, data perspective. Um, and then the need for formal evaluation. And so on that one, I would say that um, in some of these other authorities, like an 1115 authority, an evaluation is required. Um, almost everything else that we do in the Medicaid program, an evaluation is not required. Um, and so if you say, well, Caprice, you know, you should, you should, you should um, do your, do it, do an evaluation. It's important. Um, and so I tried, I tried to include in the fiscal note dollars for an evaluation. Um, it's not something quite frankly, that a lot of legislatures um, prioritize. I think, you know, from their perspective, if they're thinking about their constituents and their providers, they want the money to go towards the services. And I totally understand and agree with that. However, without a formal evaluation, I don't know the impacts of these programs. So just in the last minute, I will say that, you know, um, to the extent, and I've been on some national calls about this, to the extent that Medicaid programs can work with organizations like yours, um, that may be one of our that may be one of our um, most reasonable options. And so I think, and I've seen these partnerships over the last 20 years. Um, when I was at the University of Florida, we had quite a um, sophisticated partnership with the Medicaid program. We had all of their claims and all of their data, and we did these types of analysis for, these, for them. Um, here in North Dakota, we're not that fortunate. And so as you all think about that's one thing you bring to the table. You have data analytics, you have status, statistical um, capacity, you have students who are looking for projects. And if this is an area you're interested in, I would encourage you to reach out to your state, um, reach out to other states because there, there is the ability um, to really have a good mutual experience here. So I will stop because I am right at 340, um, but, I could go on and talk about this all day, but I will stop and see what questions you have. Thank you so much, Caprice. I um, it sounds like the door um, the door is open if we, uh, in particular, have students who have research questions that um, could be answered with uh, data from North Dakota. So um, we that that sounds lovely. It is time uh, for us to entertain questions from the audience. Okay, here's one. Um, Caprice, this is a long one and it's about who does, who are the trained qualified practitioners that can use the who does? Is it MDs only or other provider types like PAs or nurse, um, or NFPs or others? I know in some areas of Oregon, there are shortages for MD providers. And I'm wondering how requirements for being a qualified practitioner may impact the ability to access someone who can conduct the HUDAS to get into okay. the program. Good, so now I get to tell my story about the 25. Okay. I was hoping you, yes. that was the question I was gonna ask was tell that story. Okay. Yes, good. okay, so I fought really hard on the fact that why can't this be self-administered? And I lost that fight. 
Um, but the fight that I did win is I said, okay, if it can't be self-administered, I want anybody who is any type of professional to be able to administer it. And I won that fight. So it can be a school counselor. It can be a licensed social worker. Um, and in fact, we wrote it to, it's like anybody that has a bachelor's degree in these types of things. And I made it so broad, like human services, education. I mean, it's, it's pretty much anybody. Um, I still think that's a little silly. And that's saying that, um, you know, these clients know, I, I mean, you know, it, it's just making an assumption about the clients that I don't like. But nonetheless, we pushed really hard to make it as vague as possible. Um, and so when we started trialing it out, all that they're required to do is go to the website and go through um, the World Health Organization just shows them sort of the instructions. This is how you administer it. This is how you score it. It's pretty straightforward. Um, so they have to go through that and then they can fill it out. Um, so when we started this, we had 50 as our benchmark. Um, and like all good, um, like all good state um, agency workers, we guessed. Uh, we made an educated guess, but you know, we looked at the research. There's, you know, we looked at a study from Taiwan, we looked at another study from Illinois. I mean, so we made the best educated guess that we could. Um, and then we kept hearing in the first couple of months, and this is again why our numbers are low, boy, that's hard. You know, I, you know, I went through the questions with my client. I was very sure she was going to get into the program and she, you know, she got a 35 or she got a 32. Um, so we said to them, okay, instead of guessing, you send us your data, you fill the thing out for every one of your clients that you serve because you're already, you already have grants, which say I'm serving this vulnerable population. You fill it all out. You send it to me. We'll collect the data. We'll analyze it. And sure enough, they were right. Um, and so we saw breakpoints, and the lowest breakpoint was at that 25. Um, and so we then put in an amendment to CMS. We said, we, we think we got it wrong. We want it moved from 50 to 25. Um, and we recently got that approved. I will say though, um, the political side to this is, um, if my stakeholders had their way, it would be zero. And, and I totally understand that. I, I mean, I think their, their approach is by default, if you're in Medicaid, we should be providing these services to Medicaid clients. I understand that. The federal government has said, no, we will not let you do that. And so I think there will always be in any of these programs, consternations around, well, what scale did you pick and what's the cut point? Um, and so that's why, you know, we went first and did the picking and the cut point. And then we really listen to them about the revisions. Um, our, you know, and so I think some of those low numbers are because just last month we moved from 50 to 25. Um, and so I do think we'll start to really ramp it up after that. I, I pick up as you, we have another question that I'll, that I'll get to that, but I pick up as you talk that there is a level of fight that you're doing um, to get the right services, set the right data, collect the right data, advocate at various levels. The question is from Marion, one of our HMP health management and policy and extension faculty members. You mentioned how challenging it is to get programs like this started in terms of communication and dissemination across the state. Can you share any additional learning or insight related to that aspect? of this new effort? Yes. Um, so again, I think one of the things that I mentioned was becoming a Medicaid provider and training people on billing. I, I just, I don't know, I've been doing this 20 years. I mean, everybody knows how to bill. Well, I was super duper wrong. And so we spent more time pulling together PowerPoint slides. We have multiple training sessions. We record them. Even if we don't, even after we've done the training sessions, I still have to have Q&A. Uh, because somebody runs into a specific issue. I had to pay the call center more to have a, a person specifically trained in these questions. Um, so those are all the types of things that, um, you know, perhaps we should have thought about, you know, but we learned those lessons and we learned them quickly. Um, you know, the other thing is you have to look to see what's out there um, and you have to make, you have to make it um, enticing for the providers. And so what I'll say, I'll just say one thing about that. At a, as a state, 
we're like, oh, everybody should do this, right? It'll save the state money because they'll move from a grant over to Medicaid and that'll help save us all money. As a provider, I would be going, well, if Medicaid is hard and it's hard to build and it's hard to sign up, why, why would I stop? Go, why would I go away from my grant? Um, and so um, part of the incentive there is to try to have conversations with our nonprofits to say, you're still going to do your work because we're never going to enroll everybody in Medicaid. And that's your goal to serve them. And we're never going to serve people outside of Medicaid, which is who you're serving. And so this is a compliment to your work. It should help you. Um, and then the other thing is Medicaid is stable. And so some of the nonprofits that we talk to would say things like, well, if I don't get one grant, I'm going to have to let go two of my staff. And so again, getting them to think from a business perspective that yes, this is difficult to learn how to build, totally agree with that, but it puts you on a track which makes you a bit more stable. So lesson learned there is we should have written in and already had ideas about all the provider technical assistance we were gonna do, um, you know, even before the start. Um, and so, have, and now I'm flipped and now I'm going to focus, now we're also focused on the clients as well, right? Because I'm seeing these numbers and I'm thinking, well, everyone tells us that, you know, they want to sign up their clients. Everyone tells us that their clients are eligible. So what is it now that's stopping the clients? So now we've also hired a navigator to go into work specifically with the clients um, with the thought that, um, you know, I can't just leave it to the providers to help push them through and enroll them. They may need actual somebody calling them and saying, Are, is it okay? Can you show up on Tuesday to fill up the hudas with me? So they're going to need more assistance. And so again, those are things that, um, and they're not front end things. I think we're going to need those technical assistance resources throughout the life of the program um, because we get new clients and new providers. So that was a big lesson learned. Um. Let's pivot a little bit back to research questions and evaluations. Uh, we've got a, a question from Sandy Phibbs, who manages our research and innovation projects at the Center for Health Innovation. Uh, we know evaluation resources are always unfortunately limited. Uh, could you talk a little bit about some of your immediate priorities? What might keep you up at night? Any burning questions? Priorities in terms of getting evaluation. The yeah, evaluation. Getting the Right, so getting the infrastructure to do the evaluation or just the questions that aren't being, I, I mean, I'll answer both of those really. Yeah, sounds like both. Sounds like infrastructure might be one of them, but say more. Oh yeah. yeah. So um, the infrastructure issues, meaning I don't have an evaluator, I've got these data problems. We're now tagging, I told you at the beginning of it that, about that American Rescue Plan Act dollars that are out for home and community-based services. I'm now going to a different funding source to try to shore up the infrastructure. Um, and so again, as a researcher, you're gonna see what I did in Medicaid, but then on the other hand, I've got this other funding source over here that's really propping up the program. Um, then in terms of the questions that are being asked, I will say we are always required to report quality metrics on these to CMS, but they're not really outcomes. They're like inputs and outputs. It's like, how many people did you serve? How many people got housing? So, you know, in some sense, yes, we're keeping track of utilization. We're keeping track of when people sign up for the program and then fall out. You know, we, we can do a little of that. Um, but what CMS is not asking um, and where my bigger issues are, are around um, larger health outcomes. So is this, um, we know that having stable housing is really the key to, to so many, so many things. And so if we're making this investment and we're getting people stable housing or at least setting them up in stable housing, how does that equate on the back end? Are they showing up for appointments? Are they adhering to medication? Are they, um, seeing um, seeing their primary care physician are they so yes everybody always ask about ed visits and inpatient but to me i'm more interested on the prevention side i want them hooked up to that primary care system as quickly as possible and that's really what we've um, charged the care coordinator doing is do they have an assigned pcp are they seeing that assigned pcp 
Um, and so those are the kinds of outcomes that I'm interested in. Now, I, I will say one quick word about ED visits and inpatient visits, because I've given this lecture a couple of times um, to other states and to some national organizations. And they've said, well, what's your ROI? And <laughs> I have to say like, this pains me as an economist, but I'm gonna say it. Stop asking me about ROI. These things cost money. They take, they, they require resources. And so I, I'm not running a program to save the state money. I'm, I'm running a program to provide really needed services and it's gonna cost money. Is it nice if at the end of the day, ED visits go down? Yes. But this is not an, an ED diver, diversion program. So stop saying those words. And so um, we've tried to look at say, and say those words differently. This is an upfront investment. This is about the long-term health of the clients. And in some ways, this could get people off Medicaid. And so we've stopped saying those words. Um, I know that that's not sexy when you have to write a grant, right? Everybody wants those words. And I'm still interested in their health outcomes, 100%. But it can't be the first thing that we try to, to say to the legislature, because then what they're going to do next session is they're going to say, how much money did you save? And I'm going to say, I didn't. I spent $8 million. And they're going to say, well, what? You told me there's an ROI for this. You told me this is going to save money. So we have stopped saying those things. Um, and to be honest, um, I've also, from a philosophical standpoint, stopped saying those things because these are things people need and they cost money. Just like when I go to the grocery store, it costs money. And so we should not always be thinking of Medicaid clients as how can we save money? How can we cut things? Or how can we? So I will, I mean, that's a big rant. But, um, no, yeah. it's, it's a timely rant because I think a lot of us at, um, in public health and in global health in particular are mourning the loss of Dr. Paul Farmer, who argues that exact same principle, right? Um, okay. Around it, it's going to cost what it costs. Are there other questions uh, in the audience before? Uh, before we wrap up for our, um, if you have um, even thanks, a comment, a question for Dr. Knapp, we have a minute or two before we give a little bit of a break. Uh, for our graduate students um, who are listening, there is uh, a visit uh, at two o'clock, so in about six minutes. Um, and I think Marie is gonna say a little bit more about that, but thank you so much, Caprice, for being here.